All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us tonight at the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. We're going to get things started here in just a minute. For those of you tuning in to the live stream, we appreciate you joining us. Please spread the word by clicking that share button. Um, for those of you here in the museum, we do appreciate you coming out uh, and joining us. We're going to get things started by introducing our host and curator for the evening. Please welcome the journalist, writer, historian, Mr. Larry Blumenfeld. Hey, good evening. Welcome to the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. Um, it's a little bit emotional for me to be here. It's a little bit emotional for me to be almost anywhere in public. This is um, the first of these events that I've done in person in this room in almost two years. Um, last week, last Tuesday, I went to the Village Vanguard to hear live music, to hear Ron Miles' great band for the first time in almost two years. Um, and this is a place that I've been coming um, that I have great love for and that has supported my interests, my passions, my ideas for more than a decade in doing programs. You know, it's, the tonight's thing is called Creative Music in the 21st Century. And a lot of, you know, we're gonna celebrate a number of things and a number of great musicians um, that have to do with an idea of playing music you can imagine and music you want to instead of playing what people told you you should and shouldn't play. Um, and this museum, which you know could have been a quote unquote museum, has really reflected that attitude in being a jazz museum. So uh, I don't want to say too much, but I'll say um, again and again, my ears have drawn me to recordings on Pi recordings, um, based on who makes the music, what kind of music is made. 20 years ago, Seth Rosner, who had worked at a great downtown club called The Knitting Factory, left that job. A couple of years later, he started a record label. That's what we used to call those things then. We used to call them record labels. Um, and people knew what that meant. And uh, he began Pi Recordings with two simultaneous releases from Henry Threadgill. Everybody's Mouth a Book, which with a band that was called Make a Move, which I loved, and another, Up Pop the Two Lips, with what was then a newly formed band, Zuid. Um, and I'm thrilled to tell you that Henry Threadgill is here with us, and we'll be having a conversation with him and others later. Um, before long, Rosner got a cold call from Yulin Wang, a former finance industry professional looking for a different kind of fulfillment. They've been partners ever since. Pi Recordings has been a, a home for boundary blurring pioneers and bold new voices of what some, including me, like to call creative music, um, including Henry Threadgill's music. So Threadgill's recording with that Zuid group, In For A Penny, In For A Pound, was awarded the 2016 Pulitzer Prize for Music. And on Friday, his latest recording, Poof, will materialize. <laughs> with that very same group, Zuid. Um, another musician who I got to know at first through one of his recordings on Pi, and who I've followed and bothered and has indulged me in all sorts of things ever since, is the musician we're fortunate enough to hear tonight. Um, pianist David Vareles is someone who I go and hear whenever I can go and hear him. Um, I'm not gonna list the long names of people that he's played with, collaborated with, that includes Henry Threadgill, and includes the percussionist Roman Diaz. Um, I'm not gonna say any more about that except to tell you that he's a mesmerizing player who was born in Santiago de Cuba, who came to New York, and can speak with equal authority and play with equal authority when considering the great swath of Cuban music or the great swath of American music that includes heroes like Thelonious Monk and Bud Powell. So please join me in welcoming David Reyes, and after that, we'll talk.
been uh, almost two years since I got to hear that live, so it's even more emotional for me now. And I know that there are a number of you who aren't here, who are online, and uh, I hope you can, some of this vibe, which is getting more and more powerful, can reverberate to you in your homes. Um, I'm going to invite David to sit down here and invite my other panelists to come sit up here. Um, and I'm going to say, first of all, that you know, uh, in my in my writing for the Wall Street Journal and in other places, I've written about David as really, to me, one of the come on up, one of the elemental presences here um, in you know jazz, but also just in modern music. And I've also written about Henry Threadgill as really someone who probably established the very landscape for what musicians like David Varelez does. I, can, I could go on and on for the rest of the night, but we wouldn't get to talk about Mr. Threadgill, um, who was born and raised in Chicago, who came of age in Chicago around the same time and in connection with the founders of the Association for the Advancement of Creative Musicians, who came to New York in 1970 and began leading a series of bands that were unconventional in their instrumentation, in the category list nature of their music. Um, and you know, for me, I guess those of us who love music each have one composer who is the composer of their lifetime. And for me, that's Henry Threadgill. Okay. Um, uh, sitting next to Henry is Seth Rosner, who had the idea 20 years ago for Pie Music, and um, you know, in my work, I've tried to document this whole landscape. What he, and sitting next to him, Yulin Wang, have done with Pie is not just document this stuff, but really nurture and foster and enable this kind of creativity. So, you know, part of this is happy birthday, Pie, for 20, what happens in the third decade? Sitting to my far left is Val Janti, AKA Val Inc., AKA DJ Val. Okay. Yeah. A couple of years ago, she was pretty much in the same spot here for a different program I was doing with Terry Lynn Carrington on drums, Chris Davis playing piano, and she was playing, um, she was playing digital drum pads and it was completely mesmerizing. Um, she was born in Haiti, and let's see, how do you describe it? When, if you go to her website, the description you'll get is, invite, well, leads listeners into her dreamlike expressionism of Afro-Creole and Afro-Electronica compositions. And once I heard what she was doing, I understood what that meant. So. Uh, We've got a lot of people here. We've got only so much time. We want to talk about the joys, the challenges, the reality, the sense of community that goes into making creative music in the 21st century and the kind of things that gave rise to the idea of Pi and where that leads. Um, the obvious place to start for me is Henry. Um, I guess if I can ask you, I talked a little bit about Chicago in the 60s. New York in the 70s, moments of revolution for you, and then I guess 20 years ago when you began Zooid and working with this label. How, what, what can you tell me about how those environments were similar or different in terms of making music? Or even just the, the environment for making the kind of music that you want to make? Marketplace. You know, you have a farmer's market here, <laughs> Wall Street. This is where everybody brings their goods. <coughs> if you lived in Detroit, Chicago, you had the luxury of uh, time and um, the no pressure of the market. You had to make a small market for yourself, you know, <clears throat> meaning you had to develop an audience. 
But um, once you got here, it was just about developing your audience, you know. So like the the people that came here, all of us, you know, it was a it was a migration here to New York. A lot of people forget they talk about the music a lot, but there was a it was artistic migration to to New York in the seventies. It wasn't just it was. Kansas City, St. Louis, Chicago, L.A., San Francisco, Detroit. It was from all over and all over Europe, and it was from all the different idioms. I mean, it was, it was the dancers that came. It was Inazaki Shange, all the writers, Jessica Hagedorn, the actors, painters. They all came <clears throat> in the 70s. That's because every, all, the new, all the famous New York people were in Paris. <laughs> so it, it was a big, uh, it was a big vacuum here. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and what we discovered, uh, the audiences here were, they were just kind of dissatisfied because they had heard a lot of traditional music <clears throat> for a long time. And all of the big names were in Europe. So it was ripe here for all kinds of new music to be developed, you know. I mean, right, I mean, over to the pop kit. Punk, everything. We were on one corner, and Punk was uh, uh, CBC GBs was across the street from right. the Ten Palace, you, you know. So all this music was going on, and electronic stuff was going on down in Soho. Everything was right there, say at Paula Cooper's gallery, you know, where Steve Reich and Lori Anderson, all of them were down there, mm -hmm. which was right down the street, right. So everything was like going on at the same time, and everybody kind of had emerged here, like I said. But the difference <coughs> in terms of making music, all of a sudden we were in an arena with like uh, making music with a lot of other people because the, the ACM, we made music with the ACM people basically, right. you know. And uh, that was a unique experience because that was a, um, um, that was about the committed or commitment. And the commitment to your own original music. Uh, yeah, but it, w it was about commitment. You know, it's, you couldn't come here and expect to get people to do what we did in Chicago. Mm -hmm. You couldn't get that kind of commitment, you know. Right. It was like Icy's or the Taliban. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. what I call commitment. <laughs> I, I remember. That's Islamic State. That's commitment. <laughs> you know? I remember you once talking to me about Chicago back then as, you know, I'm going to build my house and you're going to help me build it. I'm going to help you build your house in terms of that kind of commitment. You see, we, you, um, we would go out, we would be out on the corners on Friday night uh, passing out our literature <clears throat> at the uh, bus stops and train stops. The Black Panther Party would be there passing mm -hmm. out their literature. The Nation of Islam would be there passing out their literature. And the AACM would be there passing out their literature. You know. Now all those people were committed too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> those were committed groups too, right? But uh, once we got here, we tried to bring in some of the, we said we had to forget about doing the AACM thing in terms of bringing in more people. We just have to work with people as they best we could, you know. And there was a lot of interesting things happening here anyway. So, and we had done what we needed to do. We had, uh, everybody had pretty much established what they were about musically before we got it. Because you wouldn't have made the move here if you didn't have had got your language and your concepts together. You would stay in Chicago. <coughs> and, you know, there's people who stayed there that just didn't want to come here, you know. And uh, the others, that was the other people went to, some people came here, artists came to uh, New York, other artists went to California, LA. You know, and I mean, I mean that across all different genres too. Mm -hmm. The dancers, the actors, they all, they either went to, they came to New York or they went to LA, it was one or the other. You know, the Earth, Wind, and Fire, they went to, out that, to LA. You know. uh, it was a number of, of players that we all played with that went that way. And if you fast forwarded to 20 years ago mm -hmm. when you created this group Zooid, which mm -hmm. now 
lives on. And when I was they lucky. <laughs> well, what, what was the environment for what you do like then? I was lucky. It was just a moment I found these people. Mm -hmm. uh, they were and committed. we went, I'm sorry. They were committed. Yeah, they were committed. Tw 20 years, they're yeah, still Yeah, they there. were committed. committed. I mean, we went into a rehearsal for uh, over a year. Really? And uh, with no idea of, like, there's a gig. I mean, we rehearsed every week. It was just like being back in Chicago. Mm -hmm. We rehearsed every week, you know. This, this, we worked on this material and got the concept down and got a feel for each other over a year of time. And nobody complained or nobody missed rehearsals, you know. They, <laughs> everybody had the other gigs to work but they were committed to this one thing, you know. <clears throat> and uh, that was one thing I've always been telling the younger musicians here, that was one thing I was, was starting to see problems with. Uh, the, a lot of young musicians weren't committed to each other. You can't get anything done unless you, unless you support. If, if you, got, you put three or four guys together, then the guy tell you, oh, somebody's gonna give me another gig, man, they can pay me $2 more, you know. Mm -hmm. So you're going to go play with them because they're going to give you $5 more rather than stay with this one group. You have to do that. That's how all the music got made. <coughs> it got that way, but well, was made uh, by Duke Ellington. It was made that way by <laughs> uh, Woody Herman. It was made that way by the New York Philharmonic. That's before they had unions. They rehearsed their ASS off until they got it down, you know. The same way Sun Ra rehearsed, the same way they all had the same method, commitment to the group to get the music down, you know. And uh, that started, I, that kind of troubled me here uh, th in the last 20 years with some of the young musicians, because I would hear them saying, you know, they had a gig and then they canceled because this one, for one person left because somebody had offered five dollars more, you know. Um, and the reason that is, is because it's kind of been a break in the, um, uh, let's call it the, uh, the, the, the uh, transfer of the culture, the musical culture. Uh, all of the, everybody came here, like I said, this was Mark, but you came here to join, <coughs> to be up under the baton of Leonard Bernstein, or to be, you, you know, with Miles Davis, or somebody, right? Now all of these people are dead. <laughs> <laughs> right? They're all dead. <clears throat> so there's few places where you can learn the tradi you know, the tradition, the tradition playing, I'm not just talking about playing music, how you're supposed to work with each other and respect mm -hmm. each other, support each other. That is not, they're not understanding that anymore. I was, I remember in an uh, interview with Herbie uh, Hancock, he was talking about when he was, uh, when he was with Down and uh, Down Bird and Miles Davis asked him to come and Down, Down Bird, he was he was very upset because he didn't want to he didn't know what to do he, he said he felt like he was a ba he was uh, being dishonorable to Down Bird he had Down Bird had taught him so much and he learned so much Down Bird said you better go man it's time for you to move on mm -hmm. you know it's cool you know but and it was cool he didn't, he had, still had respect for Don Bird, and he went to Don Bird and said, look, you know, should I <laughs> take this thing with Miles? So of course you should, you know. So the, like I'm saying, the musicians, a uh, lot of them, they never had a chance to play with Charlie Mingus or different people. I mean, some of them get, it's very few people <laughs> besides me <laughs> that's in the trenches. <laughs> I mean, Andrew Hill was here, you know. There's not too many band people that, band directors, band leaders that are left in the classical and the jazz world, you know. That's where that information is passed. I mean, I've, I've played in so many different, uh, under so many different uh, great uh, music directors and band directors, you know. Uh, I think I was talking to you, Lionel, he was up talking about some people, he said, I didn't know you played with so-and-so, you know. You, you forget over the time, you know, but like I remember the lessons, you know, of, of being up under these people, you know, more than just playing the music. Like I said, how are you supposed to uh, behave? How are you supposed to uh, mm -hmm. keep your ears open and watch certain things, you know? And yeah, I mean, in all the many 
different ensembles that you've led, I've always felt like, okay, these are not just musicians who know how to play together and want to play together, but there's some sense of community. Mm -hmm. So that, that idea you were talking about, about soaking up and having, even if not mentorship, some kind of leadership. I know David, when did you, you first you went from Cuba to Toronto and then came to New York. When did you first come to New York? I came to New York in 2009, actually, um, after I received a grant from the Canada Council for the Arts, actually, to study with Henry. Yeah, I remember. I called Henry up, and, um, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I was able to, you know, to talk to him through, through um, Daphne's, actually. Who Daphne's I knew, you know, had worked the drummer, with Daphne's, Daphne's before. Yeah. yeah. And, of course, you know, Daphne's had worked with Henry. You know, he's actually on, on every, yeah. everybody's master book. So, um, so you know, that way I you know, got in touch with Henry and, so and what, what convinced were you, him. <laughs> what were you seeking? What were you seeking in coming to New York to study with Henry Threadgill? Well, exactly what he just, what he just said. You know, that's just, I wanted access to that. And, uh, and, of course, you know, I was just, you know, since the very first time I heard his music, I just fell in love with, with that sound and, and I knew that I, that I wanted to learn something about that. So when I was presented this opportunity, I, you know, I called Henry up and he was gracious enough to, to accept me to, you know, to basically come to New York. And, you know, we, we did so many things that were outside of like formal lessons, you know, like we went to see Elio Carter, you know, when he, you know, when <laughs> 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 you know, Elio Carter was, was uh, premiering a piece at the, um, was it at, at I don't think it was Carnegie Hall. No, Academy, but, um, but you know, we would do things like that, you know, and you know, went to see Yusef Latif, went to see Muha play, you know, many times, you know, introduced me to the ACM concerts. And one thing uh, led to the next, you know, I got to meet Muha, I got to you know, meet so many people in the ACM, and, and from then it just kind of grew, you know. And eventually um, we started doing, you know, Henry started inviting me for different things that he was, uh, that he had in mind, you know, uh, so, so yeah, I just want, that's the reason I, I came here, to be part, to be part of that, you know. Now, I know, David, you were generous enough, a couple of years ago, I did a series here about the connections between Afro-Cuban traditions and the jazz traditions of New York City, and you talked in great depth about those things. I know, growing up and training as a musician in Cuba, you got first-hand exposure to a lot of things, some which, you know, we would not have access to. But the traditions of the New York scene and the jazz scene was things you mostly soaked up through recordings. So what, what about that tradition did you gain through this kind of first-hand relationship? Well, in, you know, just a certain, you know, like Henry said, um, just a, cer a certain uh, look into the into the culture, you know. I was invited into into a culture, you know. So mm -hmm. because my own culture has very deep ties to 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 the to the culture of of this music, you know. Henry played, with, you know, this is something that not many people know, but Henry played in Mario Balsas band. You know, this vi this footage of I this on, the on, on YouTube, you know. This is the great Cuban bassist and composer. Oh, the great Cuban trumpeter and composer, Mario exactly. Boza, who, you know, is, I would say, as elemental a force in the connection as was Chano Pozo. Yep. So He's one of the architects. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that's, you know, I feel like I'm, you know, I've been just extremely blessed to, to have access to that, you know, have access to, uh, you know, people like, like, like Barry Harris, you know, when I when I first came here, um, the very first time the very first time I, I visited New York, I actually I was hanging out a lot with, with Barry, you know, who when I was living in Toronto he would come up a lot. So mm -hmm. um, I mean not complete but you know a little bit more information about this music that I was intrigued about and that I was studying through through recordings and that I immediately just felt the connections, you know, like some so many historical and so many uh, cultural and 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 um, and spiritual connection. So so, I just came here to to keep finding out more about that and also to just kind of find myself. You know, just kind of 
um, figured out, you know, what I was what I was gonna do with 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 what I was hearing, you know. I I can't resist the urge to ask you, Henry, what do you remember about playing with Mario Barra? Oh God, that was, that was a fantastic experience. He was such a great. Um, He's a great person, but he's a fantastic uh, composer and arranger, and, and I really have to say, really quick, quick arranger, who mm -hmm. could could arrange two right on the spot. You know, we would be doing a, we'd be playing a piece, and he and he was, no, 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 Henry, play play so and so. He'll do, oh, he'd tell Rolando, 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 switch with Henry. Y'all do so and so, so and so. You know, <laughs> you know, and <laughs> he would just change the music like that, like that. You know. But he was like such a uh, he. Sh he was he shared so much with me. I, we we had, had a really close relationship. I used to be at his house all the time. He told me so much about the history of the of the music of jazz and the and the music from uh, Cuba and Puerto Rico coming together. But the problems was, you know, the way that the uh, musicians, the jazz musicians, were playing time against the Clave, there's two claves, you know, where you, you know, Cubans and, and where the Puerto Ricans, where they placed it, you know. And it took them a lot of work to get that worked out. It was first Kenny Clark and then Max, you know. But the interesting thing was, people was always telling me, say, the music always worked out under Charlie Parker. <laughs> <laughs> Every time Charlie Parker played the music, we just say, click, you know. There'd be no rhythmic problems <laughs> when he played. And when he stopped playing, they even struggled, but they got it worked out. But his um, his uh, openness, he he uh, he hired me to he hired me on a recommendation of Rolando Bosigno, you know, the alto player from Venezuela, and um, but he hired me to, to as a soloist. He wanted me to improvise. Mm -hmm. That's what he hired me for, and mm -hmm. and he knew about. He knew about what I was doing, so he knew that I wasn't gonna, I wasn't get ready to try to play it all this traditional way of playing because he would get very upset with, he would get upset with the music. He'd say, "Henry, go play, go play," you know. And uh, I told myself, "I want to stay friends with everybody in the band," you know. <laughs> he would tell me to go play and cut people off, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but he but wanted you to take that music out. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, that was a great, I mean, uh, so many people, I met so many people, uh, uh, Carlos Garnett came mm. through that band, I remember uh, Don Byron when he first came through, he came in that band on baritone. Wow. So many great players in that band. I, I played with his band, <coughs> I think before I went with him, I was with, a lot of people know, I was with uh, Howard McGee, mm -hmm. Octet, for a long time. I played baritone with Howard McGee. I left Cecil and went to Howard McGee and then to Mario. Um, or, yeah, I was with Mario and Cecil simultaneously. Yeah. I know a long time ago I talked to you, probably I was writing about David and I talked to you about David coming, seeking you out and, you know, talked about him talking about you as a mentor and you said, nah, it's not like that. That's right. And so uh, that <laughs> leads me to ask you, what, what have you gained from this relationship with Daphne? When it started, I mean, when uh, I think uh, Daphne's played me a tape, I said, well, what does he want? I said, I said, well, <laughs> he, said he couldn't want anything. I said, he's got everything going on. I said, what does he want to see me for? He want to show me something? <laughs> <laughs> no, we would, uh, we would just like, really just go at music. You know what I'm saying? I was uh, telling Marta, I remember David would have this, Music was coming out of some Zodiac stuff that he was working on. You remember he was doing mm -hmm. the Zodiac stuff? And I'm saying, I really liked that because that's a whole other way of looking at things, you know. Uh, and it, it wasn't it wasn't like it, uh, I'm not a teacher, number one. You know, I work I work I work with different people at certain times on music, you know, and in different ways to investigate it. You know, investigate what they want to investigate or they can ask me questions. That's it. I don't have anything to teach anybody, you know. We can, we can work together. That's about it, you know. But David was already, already all the way out there when he got here. He just didn't know it, you know. He just didn't have confidence, <laughs> in, you know. He came here, he was like, 
oh man, how am I gonna make it in New York? In no time, I couldn't even catch up with it. Everybody was calling me, you know. <laughs> he, he said, I don't know how I'm gonna live here. How can I pay the rent? How can I do this, that, and the other? I said, yeah, 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 right, right, right. <laughs> right, right, right you know. When he asked me that, I said, let's don't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> in no time, he was busy flying all over the world, you know. I couldn't catch him no more, right. <laughs> All right, now, Seth and Yulun, you've been sitting patiently. Um, do, uh, so, yeah, 20 years ago, what, what was the impulse? Uh, you know, look, we all, all of us who love music, who love jazz, we have attachments to the great labels that we could name that put out great music that's on our shelves. Um, you know, so there's the idea of we want to record and put out good, great music, but what was the impulse and what was the context? You know, it was an odd moment in the world of putting out music into the world too. So could you talk a little bit, both of you, about you know, what, what that was like and what you were trying to do? Well, I, th I think the impulse, well, I mean, a lot of impulses, obviously, but sometimes I kind of boil it down myself to just kind of like really the most selfish thing was frankly, just to be able to hear Henry more frequently than I could at that time. <laughs> you know, at that time, I would hear Henry once a year for about five nights a week, because he would have a week-long run at the Knitting Factory. Right. It was typically in December, and uh, that, that's, that, those were just weeks I really looked forward to. Um, and in the beginning, it was make a move, and uh, you know, you're know, you sort of waiting like 52 weeks, 51 weeks to hear the freshest and most exciting music, and then you're like, oh, this is you know, kind of silly. Just record him. Wait, two weeks. <laughs> it's actually a more immediate path there. You know? um, so I was, you know, frankly, very fortunate that uh, that Henry um, went along with the idea. I didn't tell him it was just, you know, to satisfy my own selfishness. I presented <laughs> it as a business plan, and he believed that. So that's, you know, <laughs> that's really beneficial for everybody, I guess. Um, but that was really it. It was, it was really just to document Henry and 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 get it out there. And. Um, you know, it was a very strange time in the music. Um, and, you know, to look back on it now, I mean, I feel like so much has happened in the past 20 years. I was speaking about it with someone earlier. You know, where we are today with how music gets documented and who's being recognized or uh, just, you know, the influences that are coming out in the sounds, it was so much different then. I mean, I think when we started the label, uh, it was right at the end of, you know, for to use as an example, you know, Winton being on Sony Columbia where he had one album out every month. You know, could you imagine a marketplace where there is a new Wynton Marsalis album every month, and that's supposed to create place for other creative music to be out there? It wasn't really what it's like now, which I think is this incredibly fertile period where so many people are doing things. And, uh, and of course, shortly before you started the label, Henry's Make a Move band was on Columbia. Absolutely, and then and then there's you know like maybe like a five-year, four-year gap, whatever whatever it is. Um, so it was just, you know, it was, it was a strange moment to just really just have this opportunity to hear, hear the music that I was interested in getting documented, you know, because shortly after Henry, it was uh, Roscoe with the Note Factory and, you know, Roscoe the art, Mitchell. Roscoe Mitchell, sorry, thank you. You know, the art ensemble was maybe a little bit in flux with Lester's passing. Um, and then shortly after that, it was Wadada. So, I mean, there was absolutely uh, a gravitation towards the AACM and everything the AACM stood for and everything that those artists stood for. And, you know, certainly those, the, those three artists, you know, were representative of the AACM, and I really thought in their own unique way. I mean, every AACM artist, just by definition, mm -hmm. frankly, is unique. But those three, very, very, very specifically, I think, had had something that I thought was, uh, you know, just needed to have a little bit more attention uh, right. shown on it. And just and I, I mean, we could rattle off the names: Taishan Sori, Jen Shu, Steve Lim, and VJ Iyer. We could go on and on of those names that have also recorded for the label, who weren't, first of all, were too young, but weren't right. officially connected to the AACM. But I do think it's fair, you know, I feel like on my watch during these 20 years, there's maybe back to that moment when Wynton Marsalis could have an album out every month. Mm -hmm. Since then, I feel like there's been this groundswell and triumph of whatever we mean when we say creative music, whatever the AACM meant, AACM meant by using creative musicians, whatever what Dada Leo mm -hmm. Smith meant in 1973 when he wrote a manifesto of creative music. I feel like, you, you know, were you consciously part of that 
revolution, or did, was that just where the good music lies? It's, it's tough to say. Uh, it's tough to say I'm conscious of it in the moment, because I think at any given moment it feels unbelievably challenging and difficult. I mean, there were certainly, there were certainly, I think, you know, uh, moments o over time where it felt like, wow, you know, for lack of a better way to put it, we're winning. You know, we're, we're starting <laughs> to win a little bit. Mm. Um, there's no doubt that, and, and this is far into it, but there's no doubt that when, you know, when in for a penny, in for a pound receives the Pulitzer, you know, that's a big win. You know, that, that, that's a huge win. And um, for that, I mean, that took 15 years, 16 years. Yeah, it was a huge win, and then for some of us, it was also, we already knew that. Right. Of it's course. a funny acknowledgment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a funny, um, funny acknowledgment. Well, you, Lynn, how did, how did, how and why did you get mixed up in all of this? So and how, how has it changed your, your life? Yeah, and so I, I got into it. Um, I was looking to get out of a prior career and casting about, trying a whole bunch of different things. And uh, I had bought some of the early Pi records mm -hmm. when Tower Records was still around, you know, when there were still record stores. And you know, I saw these records, never heard of Pi recordings, which seemed very odd, you know, for Henry Threadgill to be on some label that I never heard of, like but these were bootlegs or something. And uh, uh, but then you know, saw that record with 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 Roscoe Mitchell, and we bought that too. So I actually cold called him. <laughs> and we got together and we got really drunk. <laughs> wow, this is a, wait, so we're living in a day where there are record stores. There were people, still record stores. People call, call each other. There was, I don't remember an email address. I think I actually called him. Yellow yeah. page, white I, mean, I might have looked him up in the white, white page. Wow. <laughs> and, we're all uh, dating ourselves. Real old. <laughs> yeah, really old. And 20 years ago, right? Come, come a long way. And I remember in one of our early conversations, you know, talking about Henry, we're talking about all these amazing musicians. And. Um, and he starts talking about, hey, he's been talking, to, talking to, to, to Roscoe Mitchell about the art ensemble reforming because Joseph Jarman's thinking about coming out and coming back mm -hmm. and playing. You know, mm -hmm. I think if you're into this kind of music, yeah. to, to somehow participate in that, this is, you know, the, the, you've died and gone to heaven already. And, and what's amazing is that uh, for 20 years, um, it sort of felt like, you know, sort of one dream come true after another. I mean, the Pulitzer was one huge one, various people winning the MacArthur, being mm -hmm. others, Tyshawn Sori, Steve Coleman, and, 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 and Vijay Iyer winning the MacArthur. Those were all seemingly victories for something which, I think when Seth and I were talking about all this in 2002, you know, there was, I don't think there was a vision for any of this stuff. It, wasn't, it was just like, how do we make it to the next record? You know, who do we sign next? What do we do? You know, where is this record label going? What is the notion? What is a record label in 2003 or 2004, right? Um, because, yeah, there were independents and, you know, musicians were starting to self-release. Um, but it still felt like the major labels were very dominant. So how do we get our voices heard? How do we get people like Henry really heard by sort of a larger audience? And, uh, and that's really what we've always focused on. It's like... We're not here to document the scene. We're here to document amazing musicians making amazing art. And we want to shout from the rooftops and make sure that they all get heard. And, uh, and you know, that's what we do. And it's been doing it for 20 years. And, and yet, in a way, I feel like you have documented a scene and in a very important way. Because, for instance, Henry, when you were talking about that world you walked into in New York in the 70s where you could walk a couple of blocks this way, a couple of blocks that way, and all these things met. During these past 20 years, not so much. So for me, and for people who read me, when we see these musicians connected on this label that really does have an aesthetic, it actually does help, because that the physicality of that scene may not quite exist, and especially in this moment, doesn't mm. exist. Um, so now, as one of the ways to enter the third decade, I guess you've introduced this idea of <laughs> remixing the pie, right, the, right, lab, right. the legacy of pie. So I guess, was the first one Georgia Ann's? Remix of, uh, of Claire, yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, Henry, had how? Did that have your blessing? Oh, I loved it. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Had you ever heard your music no. treated in that manner? Hmm. Um, and one that's coming up, and one reason why we invited Val here is, so one of, one of the musicians that I've followed closely that has wonderful Pi recordings is the singer and composer and multi-instrumentalist Jen Shu. Um, and so Val, did you, were you, was it your idea to remix her Zero Grasses? wonderful release that came out earlier? Yeah, it was actually uh, Seth's idea to cool. set, um, reached out and oh. just asked me to pick someone from the catalog. So I thought, huh, definitely you gotta pick a woman. Um, and I mean, of course, you know, woman of color. And Jen, you know, she's very close. You know, we're very close. You are. So I was kind of biased. <laughs> so you, you, knew, you, knew that, you knew that music well. Yeah, yeah, I've known Jen, wow. Yeah. Since 2000, wow, 2003, 2004, so, and Jen is just sick, so I was uh, like, yeah, it has to be Jen. So, yeah. I know enough about that music and that project to know that it's not just deeply involved in music, but there are very complex and deep personal stories involved in, that are told through that music and that project. So what was, how did, I'm just curious, how did you, how did you approach this, you know, doing this? Um, well, I um, listened to it in one of the pieces, uh, which is uh, a prayer, just kind of grabbed me because the kind of work that I do is all about, you know, spiritual and prayers. And mm -hmm. so that piece just grabbed me and we just kind of went for it. Yeah, yeah. There is sort of a ritual aspect to, should we, can we uh, play a tiny bit of Jen's and then a tiny bit of what you're doing with this? Yes, Can please. Can we do that? Yes. <coughs> All right, so maybe first let's hear a little bit of that track from Zero Grasses, just a little bit. Okay, so I feel that's Jen singing. In addition to bass, I feel like that's that plus Japanese instrument, the name of which is escaping me right now. Samisan. Uh, say it? Samisan. Okay, which is among the probably seven or eight instruments she plays. So, and this is why I wouldn't dare play any Henry <laughs> Threadgill music because I'm <laughs> not going to cut it off and talk over it. Um, um, all right, can we hear a little bit of what Val? interpreted this music to do? Thank <laughs> you. 
clearly we need the time and space to really dive into this. Um, so this is going to be called prayer, and when will when we'll will this materialize? I think we'll we'll put it out in October. So we're waiting. We we did two at a time. For the first one, we did a George Ann's remix of Henry's track, and uh, Jay Lynn remix of Steve Lehman track. So it's kind of nice to release two things simultaneously that, you know, kind of sit nicely next to one another. So I think we'll we'll put this out uh, simultaneously with uh, a track that More Mother I think is just tying up, uh, where she's doing something with the, one of the earlier releases by the Revolutionary Ensemble. Um, so we just we'll get that together and put it out. And uh, you know, you were talking about third decade. I mean, just just to put it in perspective, you'd have to really dive into the credits to know this. But Val recorded actually two of our earlier releases, mm. uh, the duo of Wadada and Anthony Braxton and Atonic. Uh, Val recorded those, and we put those out as, right. uh, as sets one and sets two. Uh, so it's it was very nice to kind of be like, hey, you know, let's do this again in a different way, you know, and. Uh, it's it's nice to, it's nice to hear the collaborations. I mean, I'm curious to hear what it sounds like if George Ann collaborates with Henry. I want to know what that right. sounds I like. I want to know what that sounds like. I know George Ann <laughs> wanted to know what it sounds like. Henry, you 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 knew George Ann's dad, right? Yeah, yeah, Brown. Okay, okay. Yeah, from right. Chicago. Right. So there's so she's a, born in California. So there's a connection there. But I know she just she played in Chicago, but she's probably got relatives there. She might have met him. You know, but uh, yeah, her father was a great. So I held up earlier, Poof, which comes out on Friday, and the last couple of recordings which I loved and wrote about were larger, larger and larger <laughs> ensembles, but now this is returning to Zuid. Um, yeah, is there something that you can share with us about, about how you approach this, yeah, this music? Yeah, let me bounce back over to the veil. That's what I'm going to bounce back over to. It was such a, uh, I remember going to a house near Pratt mm -hmm. for the first time, and uh, I think Bella Boy took me there. She played me all this music from Haiti, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then when I saw what she was doing, what she did live, I said, this was really incredible, you know. Uh, where she had overtaken the whole idea, it was just like being in the ACM again. She had just taken and right. looked at things from her perspective. She said, I don't need no flute. I'm doing this with this material. Right. And expressed herself so creatively. I remember we were in uh, Venice, I think, at the Biennale. She had a whole room full of people laying out on the floor, <laughs> <laughs> listening to it, watching what she was doing. She had some projections too going, I think, at that time, right? Yeah, yeah, I think so. But I mean, uh, what, what Val has been doing, and now we have, you know, like I said, more mother than other people, but she, she, what she was doing was so powerful. It was so new to me, too, and I, it was something I totally embraced, because I'm not stuck on, on saxophones or pianos, you know. I'm stuck on creativity, you know. That's mm -hmm. what I'm really mm -hmm. stuck on. And I, see, and I saw her, what she was doing, she just extended the, the creativity, I said, wow, this is challenging and it's reaching people, you know. Because that's, the whole thing is about communication, you know. It's not about spoons or violins, it's about communication, you know. And that's what she's been doing, you know. It's great that you can get ready to put this out. I can't wait to, get, to, to, get, to have a copy of it. Yeah, well, you know, so, it was 20 years, I, we, we had, we had, hoped and planned to do a lot of stuff that obviously the pandemic uh, paused. So this was kind of, this was a fun way to look back, reflect on some of the stuff we'd done, and at the same time, you know, obviously look a little bit forward. I don't know if it's something that'll continue down the road, as Yulin said, you know, we, we understand what we do and it's, you know, it's nothing that's we particularly verbalized, it's not the Constitution, it's not written in stone. But at a certain moment, this just was felt very natural and felt very right, right, you know. And it was exciting to call Henry and, you know, talk about George Ann and Henry say, oh, I knew I knew George Ann's father, and then speak to George Ann and say, Oh, well, my first albums, I had a track dedicated to Henry. I love Henry, you know. So it's, you know, it, it's, it's so uh, it's so refreshing. I'm telling you, because it's not like you know the period where people were sampling people's things. You know, this is a this is not sampling. Right. You know, not at all. This is a 
this has opened up the whole idea of uh, arranging and orchestration. Arranging and orchestration has been brought back into the picture in a whole new perspective. Mm -hmm. A whole new perspective in terms of expansion and contraction of material. Yeah, I had a yeah. similar moment of awakening about your work now before I even met you when I, I had gotten pretty close with the Cuban sa saxophonist Czech way player Yosvani Terry, and I'm working on this new project, New Throne King, and he told me what he wanted to do, and I was like, well, oh, that sounds really cool. I don't know how you're gonna do that. And then I know he invited you in to create sort of soundscapes of, that really represented some of the Haitian influence in Afro-Cuban tradition. And yeah, I would, to me, it, you know, it was really stunning. Um, all right, now, now I'm gonna make you answer my question about, <laughs> about poop. About poop, what about poop? About, well, if there's any, you know, anything you can tell, tell me about what, what you were doing with Zuid on this recording or anything in particular that represents the next page and what that group is, what that ensemble is doing? Well, it was the next page after In for a Penny. If you listen to In for a Penny, it's like a bunch of little concertos right. in a way. So it's a continuation of that, of that approach. But what we were doing with the material, it was a material uh, change that we were working on, uh, that we had advanced the, uh, the way we were dealing with the, ma the written material. And gotten, we had taken it to another level, you know. But the whole idea of, it, I, I, I try to parse the, you, you got this much space, I don't want to take up all of the room, mm -hmm. you know. It doesn't make sense. I said, what well, I got these other people with me for, you know. So it's about trying to get all of these people in and getting as much out of everybody as possible, you know, independently, and them being focus of attention, and that instrument being the focus of attention, you know. Uh, th and that's what that, that that's what poof is about. It's that, like the previous, like the uh, info penny in that sense. But when you listen to uh, uh, info penny and this, this is, this is not nearly as, a lot of people thought that that wasn't dense. This is not as dense either. But we're doing, we're, the movement, uh, the negotiation of the material is different, the way we've advanced uh, in terms of the way we approach improvisation. You know. Now, David, the album Continuum seems like a lifetime ago by now, and you've <laughs> done so many different things in directions, some focused very much on the piano, some focused very much in Afro-Cuban tradition, some flipping into electronica. But when you recorded Continuum and realized that, what, what did that do for you in terms of advancing your music and your career at that, at that moment in time? Well, I mean, that was, a, that was a, I would say that was a milestone for me. You know, it was really what, um, literally just kind of, you know, opened the doors for me as a leader, you know, in, in New York City, you know, like right after the recording came out, I was invited by Lorraine Gordon to bring the, the band to the Village Vanguard, you know, so that was that was a defining moment in my, in my musical development, you know, and also to just be able to document something with that particular band, you know, with, with Andrew Surreal and with mm -hmm. Roman, Roman. Uh, with Ben Street, you know, we had as a guest, you know, Roman Filiu, Mark Turner, and Finn Lason on one track. And it was it was it was the beginning of um, it was it was really the the the, um, the synthesis of many things that I that I was working on in New York as a result as a result of of you know working with people like Henry you know uh, talking to people like like Mohal Richard Abrams Neil for Grace uh, Andrew uh, so you know it was re it was really like I said, it was just like, you know, it was a defining moment in my, in my development. 
I remember that Vanguard gig, which was remarkable, and and of course a lot of the, you know what you grew up around and what has influenced you in Santiago de Cuba has Haitian roots, um, and Andrew is of Haitian descent, and something else. Was that connection something you and he talked about, or was it just there? We didn't really talk about it much, but you know, of, of course we were aware of that and certain elements were discussed, you know, be beforehand. Um, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't anything that was, that was dealt with, you know, in any kind of specific manner, you know. That, that work I did more with Roman, you know. I kind of, the, the way that I kind of set up uh, my work and my albums in general, you know, it, it just kind of stems out of, of the piano. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you know, kind of like I kind of take the the Bud Powell model, you know, like as far as like I develop everything from the piano, and then from there, you know, I, I figured out the the different types of orchestrations that I'm hearing. But for this group, for for this group, um, it really kind of started as a trio, you know, with with Andrew and with Ben, because I actually met Andrew through Ben Street, who had worked with Andrew before. Mm -hmm. And who um, has studied with Roman. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, we used to play concerts at, um, at the University of the Streets, which actually, you know, Henry was also, the, you know, Henry's been like, like, a, like, uh, like the invisible hand, you know. <laughs> <laughs> just kind of like, you know, so, you know he's, been, he's been watching, you know, the, the development, mm -hmm. and he, he was there, you know, like making comments and taking notes, and, you know, I had like, specific questions that I would go to him with, you know, like I'd ask him about orchestration, and then he's like, oh man, you know, do you see what Andrew was doing, you know, like playing a maraca on the snare and hitting it at the same time with like a brush on the right hand, on the, on the right cymbal, and like feathering the bass drum, and you hit, you're hitting the, ba the, the bass notes with like a mallet and Benny's boy, you know, that's orchestration, you know, like <laughs> stuff like that, you know, and it just, you know, one thing led to the to to the next, you know, and the next thing we knew, we were making that record, and we just we kept on uh, on developing different things. And actually, Andrew's new record that I played on just came out, which you know is also a result of of that connection. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Val, I know that you know. Obviously, there are a lot of things that you do, and some of them involve creating and orchestrating live music. But in one of your incarnations. You're a crate digger, and a, a, right? And a, a, um, from that, per, you know, which is its own science and its own art for real DJs. Um, from that perspective, how do you appreciate this label and what they put in your crate? Or what, what you know, uh, what, uh, what do they mean in terms of that soundscape you draw from? Oh, wow, there's so many gems there, um, <laughs> yeah. And also, um, Henry, we go back to the Biennale because I did the <laughs> recording for the whole band as right. well. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, there's a whole lot of <laughs> yeah. I mean, from also like uh, from you know Jen, you know Henry, and wow. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. I mean, now I'm gonna go back and, and dig some more. <laughs> 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 yeah, there's a whole lot more to to dig into. But it's uh, it's you know it's kind of like a like a blessing too to have that, you know, to have like such a wide, you know, variety and, um, and just um, um, be able to connect with Seth and call Seth and say, hey, Seth, do you like this one? And Seth, <laughs> you know, when I sent him the, the track, you know, that I made, Seth was like, what is this? And we were talking, <laughs> just like texting back and forth. I was like, yeah, you know, do you like it? So yeah, this, yeah, it's, it's just, yeah, it's like a dream, you know, come true to have, you know, vinyls. Vinyl is like air, you know, for us. Mm -hmm. It's like a sip of air, you know. So, <laughs> air that these yeah. days, <laughs> these <laughs> days, some more shipping air. delays, we're <laughs> waiting to breathe free again. Yes. But um, when and we only heard a tiny bit of what you did with Jen's music. But were those were those beats that you played, or beats that you found, or combinations of things? Yeah, I never use beats that I find. Okay. I usually make it, yeah, because that's, you know, it creates more of like a spiritual thing mm -hmm. when it's coming from, you know, and Henry, I think, kind of nailed it. Right. You know, I'm really trying to create my own sound through my own, you know, culture. So, yeah, but the idea was definitely like, 
to have because her her um, prayer was so like kind of you know kind of like in the air. I wanted to create like the earth, right. so giving it that kind of like I would say like you know earthy hip hop, doom doom, yeah. and you know you, you can't really hear it in the room because there's no like um, sub, Trouble. but the sub in there is mm -hmm. really what's pulling you, you know like the root chakra, mm -hmm. you know, and then Jen is pulling you know the crown chakra, so it's do it's doing this kind of. Yeah, so. <laughs> but we could kind of, could kind of hear those tones coming in. And so those are tones that you're getting from pads? Yeah, this, it's all um, kind of like a um, process. Right. Process, yeah. So some of those, uh, let me see, the kick, you know, that's kind of like 808 kick, but right. you know, I had to process it right. to give it more of like a depth, yeah. you know? Yeah, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but did you hear the, I don't know, was it the whole record you put out, the one that, mm. that synthesized the piece I played? That's one of my favorite Me pieces too. That, that Don B put out. The With that crazy system. cover? The one that you, the, the, the one, one that we did together? Yeah, yeah that was yeah. one of my favorites. Yeah. Right? What he was doing, was all of this stacking, stacking material over material. It was synthesizer, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's one of my favorite pieces. It is, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had, um, I had, uh, samples, you know, kind of, you know, in the in this with the same kind of concept that I was talking about. You know, I've, I'm also <laughs> invested in kind of like coming up with my with my own sound for for the things that I um, um, culturally, you know, that 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 I that I feel connected to. Uh, regardless of, of, I mean, obviously, you know, respecting and, and, and still in connection with tradition, but you know, just coming up, coming up with, with a, with a fresh uh, view on it. So I, I was checking out, you know, different types of sends and samplers and uh, different kinds of uh, recording techniques and stuff like that. So for this one piece, I had it was actually something that I had developed out of a harmonic thing that I had worked out while, you know, from these conversations with Henry. And then uh, playing them on, on a sense just kind of brought out a, a different texture, you know, out of these kind of harmonic movements that I was working on. And then, you know, I had, I asked Henry to play on it, you know, and we did like different layers of, you know, we kind of orchestrated the piece with, the, with, the, with, with Henry, you know, just with the, with the horns. So you hear like these, these different um, layers of, of Henry, you know, and just kind of comes in and out, you know, in kind of like a dreamlike kind of, uh, you know, post, like kind of like, oops, kind of breathing kind of uh, thing, yeah. so. I've always wondered how that, how that worked. <laughs> like I've heard, because I'm listening to it. The one with Henry or the one yeah. with, because people usually ask me about the stuff with percussion on, 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 th on those well, records. Well, there's that. But the one with Henry, it was a little mystifying to know how did this come together. Well, um, to be honest, I don't even know myself. It just kind of <laughs> yeah, just kind of happened. I wouldn't be able to reproduce it if I tried to do it again. Right. But um, you know, I would say this: like this, usually the spirit of the people that are involved in making something that's what ma that's what makes it what it is. You know, and having Henry like you know. What a dream to just like be able to like e you know to even be in the same room and you know and say hey you know can we make something together like that? you know what a privilege you know when was the first time that you performed with Henry the first time I performed with Henry was actually a trio that Henry put together um, for a private concert at uh, Alain Carilli's home rest in peace yes um, and it was actually a trio that Henry put together with uh, Thomas Bugner and myself on, I was playing, uh, you know, because I didn't have a piano, I brought my, my Willitzer to the, to the concert. And Henry, Henry played uh, bass flute and um, straight flute, and then Tom on, on vocals and, and myself on keys. That's the very first time that we performed uh, live. And I actually, I actually, I was looking at some of uh, my scores of Henry, and I just found the, yeah. the, the, <laughs> the paper for it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I, might, I, I have to ask you, Henry, about that, the piece that involves multiple pianos, which I know David was involved in. 
Mm-hmm. Was that a different... You all of the PRTs. So right. <laughs> two and the three PRTs. Um, was that a different idea of stacking? No, I've always been into the idea of twos. I have, I have a thing about twos. <laughs> you know, two tubas, two guitars. Yeah. You know, two drums. Two drums. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Two, twos do something to, uh, to unison mm-hmm. that you can't just, just you know, you know, all of a sudden you got unison with two. So but, uh, I was, uh, I was, I was. In, I mean, you know, the the, fir- the double up. I was really just really interested in like writing for two pianos. I really wanted to write for two pianos. I mean, the rest of the ensemble, but to really have these really independent things going on between two different pianos was really what I was really working on. And then it got into the idea of three pianos. You know. Then four, right? Hmm. Three. 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 Okay. But I, o- I was doubling on piano and harmonium. Right. Okay. Right. But uh, p- acoustic piano was just th- three. Then we, d- then we did an uh, installation piece uh, where, I, because now I mean with, with synthesizer, uh, harmonium and piano. And uh, we play all three. We just did that one. That's not a request. It's an installation piece, but it's in the gallery on 24th Street right now. MacArthur Binion uh, exhibition at the Learman, Learman Moppin Gallery. You can go there and hear it if you go in the gallery. You know, it's fashionable sometimes for certain writers or certain people to talk about, oh, this scene was but is over, or this has reached its end, or the death of this or the death of that. But when I look around at what, say, Henry, what you're doing, what Roscoe Mitchell is doing, what Rodada Leo Smith is doing, and then at the generations that have now come, just the catalog of Pi recordings and the scene as I knew it before the pandemic hit. Henry, does it feel like, you know, those ide- the musical ideals that you were talking about 50 years ago are just as alive today? Oh yeah, definitely, definitely. Yeah, I feel like David, there's Roman. Yeah, there's Pale, Roman, <laughs> there's Pale, I mean, yeah. They're doing it, you know. There's David, they're doing it, you know, yeah. So they're, doing their own, they're doing it the way they want to do it. The music, the music is, is uh, <laughs> what, what Sonny Rollins say, there's room for everybody. That's what the one that says, it's, it's room for everybody. It's just yeah. about communication. It's not what you're doing, it's that you, are you doing it? <laughs> <laughs> That's the point, are you doing it, mm-hmm. you know? And it's many, many avenues, and it's gotten to be more avenues, which is really what it's about, you know. That's really what it's about, about people getting strong at what they're doing and getting away from these singular concepts of what uh, music is, you know, or what, <laughs> what David Hamilton told me, say, there's, there's really no definition of art, you know. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's, um, you know, if I look at that AACM moment and founding and that association and I follow, you know, which was very much, as you said, a c- together commitment and a commitment yeah. to each other, but if I follow the paths of each musician's work, they're so, they diverge in so many ways except for the basic commitment and yeah. the grounding, and they're, they're, they don't fit a school at all, and if I, you know, I've written a great deal about the great musicians that I know in New York City from Cuba, and uh, David Dage or similar, and I find that the the kinds of music each is making, even though it has a lot of elements in common, are very different. Uh, Someone who would say that's Latin jazz, well, you're wrong on both counts, and you're wrong in lumping them together. Now, we're here, you know, September 2021, and I haven't been in this room in almost two years. I just have started to go back into some clubs. Does all, you know, s- we've talked so much about the spiritual energy, the sense of community that is shared. I know 
what's happened the past year or two changes dramatically what a label can do and how a label can put on music, but does it change or alter how, you know, either process that you're making music or your ideas connected to it? Does it change things at all, what we've gone through and are still going through? So you mean just being locked down like this? <coughs> um, locked down, separated, cut mm -hmm. off from live experience for a long period, and all the turmoil that's happened in the meanwhile. That, I think know, it might have done us some good, you know. Or you there's always a positive and a negative, mm. right? Mm -hmm. And then when the, when the negative is a certain size, you start to forget about the positive, mm. you know, mm. because the, the negative seems just to take over the picture, but that's not the, that's not the whole picture. So, and I think it gave people a lot of time to think and really be quiet and silent and readdress a lot of things in their musical creative thinking. You know, because you couldn't go out there and do so, you you were locked up with it. You know, so I think it did us a lot of good in that sense. You know, you we if the if it had been no COVID, everybody been ripping and running as you just ripping and running, ripping and nobody slow down, no slow down to think about anything. All of a sudden, you got time to think about things. You know, and I think that's. That's the positive, big positive that came out of this, you know. And I know Val, you were talking about your music in terms of prayer and spiritual experience. Does it mm -hmm. change the intent or the nature of that prayer and experience? You mean during uh, the quarantine? What, what, well, what we've what we've all been through and not been through. Yeah, I think for me, the most I've experienced that kind of help was still. You know, because you know, like uh, Henry, Henry said, we're always, you know, you know, moving around, you know, being still, and you know, dealing with that silence. You mm -hmm. know, especially for me, drummers are always, you know, <laughs> DJ is always doing something, but to be still and to listen to that, because that has like a tone too. You know, for me, that was something. You know, that I'm still, you know, learning. Yeah, yeah, it's very, very spiritual because it's like within. It's not out, out there. So, yeah. <laughs> and David, do you? Any thoughts about that? Well, you know, for me, you know, prior to the pandemic, you know, like Henry said, you know, basically running around, you know, um, just playing a lot, you know, it's pretty busy um, life as a performer. Uh, then, you know, when the pandemic hit, you know, we, we, you know, all, all the concerts got um, canceled one after the other. So, you know, we pretty quickly, you know, realized that, the, you know, this was going to be kind of a long-term uh, situation. So I started, you know, thinking about different things that I could do. You know, I have been working on on, um, uh, on a solo piano project, you know, for a long time. And, um, and I, you know, finally had um, a little bit more time to, to develop this idea uh, a little bit more, you know, so I, I did that and also, um, uh, Seth and Yulon, they they approached me to try to do, you know try to put something out during this this time you know right. uh, so I think last August we released something uh, which was basically tracks that I developed uh, you know with with electronics you know from from home and um, and you know dif different kind of things you know I got into all kinds of different things that I want to study you know I I um, I got a few more pieces you know for my uh, record collection you know so i got into into a lot of into a lot of different things you know i learned how to uh tune a piano even though i cannot <laughs> really do it you know like i i got into different things but but the 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 the, the leitmotif throughout this whole time has been stillness for for me as well you know just mm -hmm. like uh, meditation you know like how do how do we how do we ne you know how do we negotiate you know how do we navigate this time you know through through our music you know through our music and uh and through through our through our spirit also of course which is you know same same thing yeah i feel like i you know my life in new york sometimes it's easy for me to 
take things for granted and oh, am I going to go to this gig? Am I going to go to that show? Did I hear that? And I had to have a, a heightened appreciation and gratitude for the preciousness of each performance and what goes into it and what's actually happening there. Um, for you guys with the with Pi, has it? You know, I, you did some really interesting things. Steve Lehman recording an album in his car, <laughs> in his parked <laughs> car, which for any of us who had our meetings or our Zoom medical <laughs> appointments or whatever from our car, this is has all of this made you think any differently about what you've been doing these 20 years and what you're doing going forward? I don't think so. No, <laughs> I, think, I think we're waiting for things to get back to where they were because, you know, mm -hmm. uh, I know that there are a lot of people with a lot of ideas that they've developed over the last couple of years and they're, they're dying to get it out. And, uh, you know, we just had to take a little bit of a pause last year. So a lot of what we're putting out now, frankly, have been gestating mm -hmm. for, frankly, years. Um, you know, we only put out five or six releases a year, so um, I know there's a lot of backlog, and it's going to take us a little while for us to work through it all. Um, can we take a few, we can take a few minutes if anyone has a question they want to ask, one or more people sitting up here? Does anyone have a question they have? I have a question, actually. Wh who made the cover of uh, Everybody's Monster Book? Who, the Sorry. artist? So Henry will correct me if I'm wrong. It was a student from Oberlin that had come to transcribe music for you. He was yeah, working with from, you. Yeah, he's from Brazil originally. Brazil, right? Yeah, he came to work with me as well. Uh, yeah, we were getting uh, students at. Um, they have a place, a hotel here, where students come in their third year to understudy and work with artists. You know, and this kid was he was a cartoonist and he was a fantastic musician. <laughs> So he drew that cover for me. And he got hired by a comic book company, too. Mm. <laughs> Wait, and what's the artist's name? I got Le yep. Is it Leandra? That, that could be How could I remember yeah. that 20 okay. years? That's amazing. Um, do you, was the cover after the music or? or after. After mm -hmm. the music. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, also, I want to say, and I, I don't know if I'm, I'm sure I'm not the only person to have said this, but before the Pulitzer for Music, I thought that Henry Threadgill should have gotten a Pulitzer in literature for your song and album titles <laughs> throughout these years. <laughs> and, um, I, sometimes I just read them. Um, I want to actually, there is some, before we close, there's something I want to read, but before I do that, please, when I'm done speaking now, help me applaud for Val Zanti, Yulin Wang, Seth Rasner, Henry Threadgill, the composer of my lifetime, and of course that incredible music and the generosity of David Varelas. I hope you're applauding and your dogs are howling in your homes. Um, happy birthday to Pi Recordings. Congratulations to Henry Threadgill on the release of Poof. Happy birthday, yeah. Muha, Richard Abrams. Happy, Happy birthday, birthday Muha. Yeah. You know, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to plug myself here, but I, when, when I realized it was Muha's birthday, I went back, it was a piece I wrote when they had a memorial for Muha in the Village Voice, which was titled What Muha Meant, and it made me mourn not just Muha, Richard Abrams, but the Village Voice which was a place where people could say, write about what Henry or David or Val does in a way that wasn't in a little box, but was about the context that you guys talk, that you people talk about when you make your music. So, yeah, Moha mm -hmm. Richard Abrams, who, God, Henry, I remember you talking. Was there any questions, though, before we... Yeah, did we have, we, did we have a question? It didn't seem like we... Oh, here's a question. Say that again, say that. Uh, hmm. I wonder if there's something going forward, coming out of the pandemic, that you're excited about, something that might be changing in the landscape, something that you 
Oh yeah, I think that you can try anything right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think this is the time to try anything because it's wide open. It's wide open. It's All wide the open. pairs of dimes that we were going by, some of them were no good in the first place, mm -hmm. and they don't need to come back, and we don't mm -hmm. know what's going to come back. So this is the time to try anything. It's wide open. Yeah. Well, as I said, there's something I want to read, and it's not something very brief. It's not something I wrote, and actually invoking Muha Richard Abrams and the ASCM just makes it, more, and our thinking at this moment, more relevant. And it's something that I had the pleasure of doing this long, just one-on-one -on -one interview with Henry Threadgill for Chamber of Music America. I had a conference, and we were able to sit there and talk through the decades. Henry talked about going to Muha's kitchen where he had graph paper out. And uh, what's the graph paper for? And but at the and I transcribed. What you, and at the very end, so this is something I've tacked up to my office wall. And it's what Henry said at the end of this talk. We don't talk about it too much, but music and art is spiritual activity. It's spiritualism of the highest order. It civilizes people. It builds humanity. Poetry, painting, literature, music, dance. In the presence of those things, people behave better. They act better. You become sensitive about humanity, and it's only through the arts that this happens in a certain way. We never verbalized that, but I was always certain that everyone in AACM had this ideal in mind. So uh, I want to again, I want to put that in people's minds and again say thank you. I'm really grateful, and this was fun. So onward. <laughs> All right, thank you everybody for joining us tonight. Thank you. Uh, get home safe and we'll see you back soon.